if I could prove to your satisfaction that God, the God of the Bible exists, would you worship him? No. Excellent. If I believed that God exists, and I believed that it was the Bible God that existed, I would not worship it because it is a criminal thing. Now, if a better God existed than the one in the Bible, I still wouldn't worship it, but at least it would be worthy of respect. That's what I wanted to find out. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Yes, sir. You can easily see the limits of science because it cannot answer the elementary questions of a child. Who am I? What is the purpose of my existence? Where am I going? As you know, there's a, there's a problem with American education that some nutcases are trying to introduce creationism into American schools, which is obviously very bad for science. And my scientific colleagues are deeply worried by this and are trying to fight it. And I would like to suggest, Richard, that somewhere down in this you're making a category mistake. Now, the thesis here is that science supports atheism, not Christianity. I think atheism under, not, undermines science very seriously. I would suggest that the sophistication of the mechanism, and science rejoices in finding such mechanisms, is evidence for the sheer wonder of the creative genius of God. My final vestige, last vestige of religious faith disappeared when I finally understood uh, the Darwinian explanation for life. Well, I would want to argue that there's a logical path from any ideology that's fanatical and oppressive to the kind of behavior you say, whether it's uh, religion or atheistic, because atheism is a faith, of course, as well. It's not. Of it, course it, it is. <laughs> Don't you believe it? Folks, welcome again. Uh, it's another segment with the uh, P.P. Simmons News and Ministry Network. It's uh, January the 9th. I'm here with Eric Hoven of Creation Today. And uh, Eric has been kind enough to sit down with us today and uh, discuss some things from the past, uh, specifically uh, involving his father and some of his ministry endeavors and then his current situation. And um, we know that this you know, can be kind of a touchy subject, obviously, but Eric, very much appreciate um, your willingness to do this and uh, just to kind of get some things out and answer some questions for some folks. Um, we get comments and questions concerning your dad uh, yeah. through the P.P. P. Simmons uh, ministry quite often uh, because of the uh, similarity in some of the topics that we get into, specifically yeah. with evolution and creation. So um, we just want to kind of let people know what's going on, maybe dispel some myths. Uh, <laughs> there's quite there's a few myths <laughs> out there. What? What? Yes, yes, there are. Uh, maybe dispel some myths, uh, let people know what's going on, um, and just uh, just kind of maybe clear the picture up on, you know, on, on what happened and where things are today. So uh, appreciate the opportunity very much. Well, thanks, Brandon. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just first of all, for people that may have never heard of, uh, of Kent Hovine and, and uh, his work and who he was, just tell us a little bit about him, you know, uh, the ministries that he started and okay. um, kind of, you know, what he did. Well, my dad, uh, amazing guy. Uh, I love my dad and I pray that everything I do uh, would honor my dad as the Bible commands. Uh, he was, uh, got saved at 16 years old in high school. Immediately after, realized, I want to tell more people about this, after he led his first soul to Christ at the age of 16 years old, after he had been saved, well, God did, but after, after he let, literally you know, dealt with them and they accepted Christ, he just he knelt down. He said, God, can I do this the rest of my life? And that's literally what he's done. He has spent his life investing in other people and witnessing to other people. And I don't know how many of you are going to be in heaven, you know, because of my dad's life. And he's not keeping track or it's all for the glory of God. But he has literally spent his life since he was 16 years old doing that and trying to invest in kingdom work. Yeah. He said all the time, Eric, we don't need to build a mansion here. We need to win a war. Yeah. Let's, let's lay up treasures in heaven. So uh, that's certainly what he's done. In 1989, we moved. Uh, he, he was a, a high school principal, a science teacher, uh, a pastor. Uh, he uh, man, ran everything he did. It was just, he's just got something about him, man. It just makes people want to listen. They want to hear him. Um, 
1989, we moved from California here to Florida, and it began Creation Science Evangelism. Actually, my brother, Kent, came up with that name. He said, hey, it's creation, it's science, and it's you're evangelizing. So <laughs> Creation Science Evangelism, which is now known all over the place. And he did a couple of unique things. He said, God, I'll do this, but number one, I don't want to copyright my videos. I want to get them out there for free so everybody can, can, can listen to them. And uh, it wasn't the digital age back then. This was uh, when you could make some money off of, you know, uh, the old cassette tapes and the VHS tapes. And, and he, uh, he said, I don't want to copyright them. Let people copy them and give them away. And that was, that was pretty huge. And then he said, God, I, d I don't want to charge for my meetings. I just want to go and, and uh, I just want you to provide. And man, God really did. And so God used my dad in a variety of ways. And uh, my dad had uh, lots of visions and lots of things to do. Began, uh, eventually started Dinosaur Adventure Land, which was a you know, a science center slash theme park type thing slash museum kind of all combined into one that, uh, that kids love to come to and uh, really became well known for his debates taking on evolutionists, uh, going out and, and he's, he got really good at debating. Yes. Um, <laughs> he got, uh, you know, traveling and speaking. He was traveling and speaking over, uh, you know, as, as far as between radio and all the different talks he did on a weekend. He, he would do over 900 talks a year. So he was incredibly busy with his schedule and really, um, uh, you know, learned from the late Dr. Henry Morris from Institute for Creation Research, which kind of pioneered the whole creation movement uh, and, and others to, and just said, I want to popularize this. I want people to know we've got the truth. So brought it down to fourth grade level. Uh, people could understand that the science and, and God has, had, had used him and still uses his videotapes. We still get emails and testimonies and Still get all that, so still using that uh, today. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. You know, you and I were having some conversation earlier, um, and I remember as a kid, um, when you guys first came here, my dad and your dad met. That's right. And kind of hit it off, had a lot of the same ideas, uh, and I remember your dad coming and speaking uh, at Hickory Hammock Church Hammock. in the oh, old yeah. sanctuary, you know, <laughs> sat a hundred people, you know. I, but no, I mean, I remember that. I mean, I, I was, I don't know, I mean, 89, 12 years old. Yeah, that's back when we were still looking at the girls. Yeah, man. Like, exactly. So, but, but no, I mean, I remember that and I can remember some of the analogies and some of the things mm. that your dad said even that night. And it was so simple to understand. I mean, yeah. here I was probably sixth, seventh grade, somewhere around in there. And I remember that. And I also know that his teachings and some of the stands that he took uh, influenced my dad in his early ministry yeah. and in getting involved in the creation evolution debate and look where that's gone today. Oh, man, here I so, thought it was going to be over. Yeah. I thought, man, <laughs> all right, this can't evolution ain't going to last long at this rate and it's big. Yeah. It's one of the biggest debates going on right now. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah, no 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 doubt about it, no doubt. Well, um what um I know that he was involved. I mean, you can get on YouTube and I can find videos and projects that he was involved in, uh, you know, just oh, all man. over the place. Yeah. And not only evolution, but he was involved in uh, in some end times prophecy stuff. Um, he was one of oh, the, yeah. he was, uh, you know, one of the, not one of the first, but to very publicly start questioning the pre-tribulation movement and yeah. some of those theories on prophecy in the end times. So, I mean, he had an amazing effect uh, in oh, the yeah. Christian world, you know, in his own right. And, um, I believe he was one of the first guys to really push the creation, uh, the creation evolution debate to the level that it has now gotten to. To a popularizing level of yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt about it. He was uh, he was out there. I mean, there were several guys uh, that are that are that were doing that, but he certainly had uh, wow. Uh, he was just all over the place. Yeah. God, well, God I, I remember some him. of his. Uh, he would publicly offer to uh, to debate anyone. I think it was like a, a ten thousand dollars or something like that at the oh, time. For he did. He said. Uh, he said, "Hey, I will get." It started off at ten thousand dollars. He said, "I will give ten thousand dollars to anybody that can give me scientific evidence there of evolution, yeah. empirical evidence." Not, and then he would define it. Now, here's what evolution is. There's six types. I'm not talking microevolution. Variations within kind. I'm talking one kind of animal to another kind of animal. Right. And of course, never got taken up. Then a guy, a millionaire friend, said, "Hey, let's up it to to 250,000." <laughs> so he said, "All right," and started advertising that 250,000 dollars reward. Anybody with scientific evidence of of Darwinian evolution that right. one kind evolved into another, and there 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 isn't any. You know what we get all the show? Here, here's what would happen all the time: emails. What bank's it in? Show me the money. Where is it at? <laughs> I remember. Uh, after my dad, uh, by the way, my dad's in prison. I don't know. I don't, that's what we're going to be talking about. But um, uh, after my dad went to prison, I remember doing a debate out in, 
in California, and I, I was supposed to debate a gentleman, and he said, you have to bring the money with you wow. to the debate. I'm like, you think I'm an idiot? Yeah. Well, what do you mean, yeah. man? I, you can't bring your evidence? But I, and that people say all the time, well, you, you, I can't just bring a spectrometer and a micro, da, da, and they, they go up on all these things that they need to try to prove it. And, and it's like, guys, where's your evidence? Yeah. All they have is excuse. They, they, they got evidence of a lot of excuses. They don't have a lot of evidence. They don't have evidence. Yeah, Let's just say he never had to write a check, right? No checks have been written. <laughs> no, nobody has, no nobody checks. won. I love it. I love it. Well, you obviously just said the you know, the million-dollar phrase there. Your mm -hmm. dad is currently in prison. Yep. Um, and uh, that's kind of, you know, one of the main reason of us uh, going on to this subject and kind of clear up why he's there and, uh, and, and, like I say, some myths and some fallacies <laughs> that are out there. So just, just kind of just give us a, a factual history. What happened why is he there, and, uh, and, and how long has he been there? Uh, my dad has always been incredibly outspoken about mm -hmm. anything he has convictions on. Uh, he's the kind of guy that says, uh, if, if I see a dog when I'm walking by, I'm going to kick it. As far as <laughs> when he's, not literally, but there's another one the evolutionists are going to use. Great. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, while he, and, and that's the way his seminars always have been, uh, is, Man, he, he's he's plowing ahead here, but boy, there are so many little bunny trails going off, and, yeah. and people, you know, appreciate that. That's why I have ADD now. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but he's just always kicking dogs as he walks by, and so he he really kicked this whole, you know, what's the proper role of government? Should uh, should the IRS be here? Should we have the income system the way income uh, the tax system the way it is? And was very outspoken about that. And now I can't verify this, but it's been told to me that that somebody took one of his tapes, sent it to the IRS, and said, this guy is a tax protester, uh, and that's what actually kind of started a whole investigation on, on Kent Hovind. Um, he had set things up as a, uh, you used to, and, and this is where, from my understanding, okay, this is kind of what I was told, that you could set things up under corporation souls. Uh, they're legal entities, you're allowed to do them, but people were using them as, as tax shelters and scams. Uh, instead of legitimate minister uses. And so he set up as a corporation soul and the IRS began cracking down on those. And anyway, at the end of the day, that's what he, that's what he got um, kind of caught up in is they, they looked at this as a, as a scam. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, right, this guy, you know, this ministry is bringing in all this money and, uh, and he's, he claims not to have any income. And he was a dependent of the ministry, but he claims not to have any income. The income, you know, the ministry provides his needs. Yeah, right. You know, we know what happens when that happens. You get gold-plated, you know, toilets and Lear jets and right. Well, there were no Lear jets and yeah. Let's no be gold, clear on that. That's no right. No gold-plated yeah. toilets. Uh, there was a, there was a van that had uh, two hundred and some thousand yeah. miles on it. <laughs> his prized possession was a, a scooter, a, mm -hmm. uh, a a scooter that he loved driving around on. Uh, but the ministry was right there in his house. It was um, the bottom line is he he, had, he literally dedicated everything. To, he said, God. I'm yours, do with me as you will. And God used that. God, God used his life. So the secular world, I don't think they, they even understand. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. You mean, why wouldn't you get all the money you can out of that ministry? To, and it's, look, it's for, it's for the furthering of the gospel. This is, right. this is what I'm, I'm not about this world. I'm about the next one to come. Yeah. And, you know, so many people, it's amazing to me how many people will talk about either my mom or my dad in such crude and rude ways. And I'm going, you got, you got no clue. Right. You got no clue. We didn't have health insurance. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have health insurance. Yeah. Growing up, I, I mean, you break an arm, you might get to go to the doctor. But, you know, short of that, suck it up, son. We, I a couple mean, of sticks and an eighth yeah, bandage wrap it up. Huh? man. <laughs> Take some Advil. Um, <laughs> we... we uh, my dad wasn't for this world. He yeah. was. Um, he was. He was for the next one. And so, um, he did a lot of traveling, a lot of speaking. Got upgraded to first class uh, eventually, as he, you know, because his sky miles were so high, they'd upgrade him. So hey, that was a plus. Yeah. <laughs> but didn't charge for his meetings. Went all over the place. I mean, literally gave his life for the furthering of creation and the gospel. That's really what he wanted his life to be about. I mean, more than I know that we're caught up in this whole. IRS battle. Oh, and that's what happened is the IRS came after him uh, and, uh, and, and has uh, uh, got a grand jury to indict him. I think it was like the fourth grand jury. They, they, several grand juries, because we found out about it, we submitted affidavits of his and 
So they, after reading the affidavit, they're like, no, we're not going to indict this guy. So that happened a couple times. Well, then they held a secret grand jury. This mm -hmm. is, again, my understanding. I could be wrong about this. My understanding is they held a, a, a closed grand jury where no, no witnesses could come. Just they presented their information. It's been said you can, you can indict a ham sandwich, and I, it's probably true. Um, and anyway, they indicted my dad, and that's what led to the whole trial. And uh, uh, at, at, the, at the trial, well, anyway, let me, let me back up before I get to the trial. My dad doesn't want his life to be about a legal battle. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it is that right now. Um, if you ask my dad, I think he would say, that's right. As soon as I win, I can go, you know, I can go back to <laughs> go back to doing what I do. Huh? So, uh, you know, I go, dad, put it away. Forget it. Who cares? This world is going to burn. This world is not our home. Let the legal system do what they want. Let's keep preaching the gospel. Uh, and he's done that consistently throughout. He's led over 400 men to Christ while he's been in prison wow. so far. So he's, uh, he's, he's, he's doing it. But um, he, he, was, he was indicted uh, on three charges. Um, failure to withhold and pay employee-related taxes, uh, uh, structuring cash transactions, and then threatening uh, the IRS and impeding the IRS investigation. So uh, number one was withhold, with, with failure to withhold. And that is, we, he didn't consider anybody there an employee. He considered everybody a missionary. Mm -hmm. When they came on, he said, look, you're a missionary. Uh, I'm going to pay you money. I want you're responsible to pay taxes. You're responsible for anything like that. Well, um, you know, looking back, that probably wasn't the wisest decision. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't do it that way. Uh, I use a, an employee leasing service, so that's as far away as, <laughs> from our ministry as we can get. Uh, but uh, he, anyway, that's the way he had it structured. He was, that's the way he was told to, to do it, and that's what he did. Right. Uh, the... Uh, structure and cash transactions, they would go withdraw money from the bank and pay the people. And uh, eventually, by 2002 or so, it was it was so much money that they said, "Forget this, we need to write checks." So they started writing checks to people instead, instead of just withdrawing cash. And you know, in in the government size, they look at that as, "Well, what are you? Why are you paying in cash? What what are you hiding?" And yeah, because cash going, is evil. You're right. I'm, and he's going. <laughs> These are college students that need money, you know. They, what are you, I just, I'm paying them. So anyway, uh, they didn't exactly see it that way. So uh, they, they was uh, found guilty of that and then uh, in, impeding the IRS. And I'm not sure what else on there, but um, my dad has consistently said uh, that that was for praying them on praying that God would smite the IRS on, on the radio. Uh, and I, I can't verify that one either. I don't know if that's the real, you know, Intent behind that, but yeah. that's that's what I've come to understand. Right. Um, so those three, anyway. Uh, the defense that my dad hired. Um, it's um, looking back, uh, mm, probably wasn't very wise. They were uh, it, doing what they did, or even the people that he chose. But they said, "Listen, they haven't even made their case. You don't need to put on a defense at all." So he didn't. They, he and my mom did not put on a defense. Mm -hmm. And so the grand jury, or the jury over the case, went out, uh, and a couple hours later came back and said guilty on all on on the on the three different charges on all counts. Right. So, uh, and then the judge said, uh, "Hey, normally this would be five years. I'm going to take all these and do five, and then add five on top of that for this count, and uh, so give him a ten year prison sentence." Right. And when did that sentence start? Started in. Uh, let's see. He went after he was found guilty. So. That would have been November of 2006, November 2006 is when that happened. Right. So at this point, we're basically looking at almost another three years that's left on that sentence, two well, years and some months? Well, in federal time, you serve 85% right now. Okay. So that would put it at uh, um, August of 2015. Okay. Now, there's something going on. He, he, he applied for and got home confinement where he gets to go home uh, but he has to stay home for under home confinement for six months. So that'll start February of 2015. And then he could get six months of halfway house uh, here in Pensacola to be rehabilitated into society. <laughs> and that would take it to August of 2014. So don't know what's going to happen there, but those are the possibilities. There's another possibility. Every year for several years now, there's been a, a judiciary committee in the Senate, I believe, Senate Judiciary Committee, that has considered cutting prison time for first-time nonviolent offenders uh, from 85%, and it's cutting it down a little bit more. But anyway, at the rate it would cut it down, if this is passed, it would send him home immediately because he's already passed that, that wow. limit. So if they pass that, from what I understand, they could be voting on it this month. Uh, if it passes that, 
you know, then, then it could go somewhere. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you, uh, uh, kind of setting the record straight with the facts on what he was actually in prison for because of lot, a lot of what you hear when his name comes up and obviously you're his son, I'm sure that you know this. Oh, that's the guy that talks about evolution and he was a tax cheat. Yeah. A tax cheat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, you said that the way people speak about your parents in derogatory, you know, yeah. manner and, I did a lot of looking into his background and, and what he was sent to uh, sent to prison for, and that's one of the first things that I found. He was not convicted of being <laughs> a tax right. chief, right. <laughs> um, and uh, and the actual crime that he was uh, uh, one of that he was convicted of um, structuring cash. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically, if you or I took our paycheck, deposited it into a bank every week, and then withdrew it all out, conceivably could be convicted of the same crime. Yeah, if, um, yeah. Which, which is yeah. kind of a scary thought in, in the world that a, we live it's in. It's a but tricky, it's a very, very, the, the, uh, there's no question they've used that law that, from my understanding, was originally developed to catch drug dealers that were going from bank to bank to bank, depositing small sums of cash or, you know, and then ma or making withdrawals and using that to kind of launder their money. Right. That's why these laws were written, uh, to catch people in that kind of activity. You know, and here my mom and dad went to one bank, to one teller at one bank. I mean, and, and the teller said, you, you know, the IRS has, has got a flag on your account. They're watching it. And they said, yeah, yeah, we know. I mean, there's not a lot we can do about it. Yeah. Yeah, we know they're watching it. So he wasn't hiding anything, obviously. You said no, he was one of the I mean, most bold, in-your-face people yeah, out so, there. So. Yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th that's but yeah, that is a misconception. Yeah. And no, all you atheists out there, I was not homeschooled. I was at the, I was at the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when his dad taught him science, he didn't, you know. Yeah. When I, uh, I was at the uh, atheist rally uh, in Washington D.C., the Reason Rally, largest gathering they've ever had of atheists in the history of the universe, um, and one of the guys interviewing me there, he's, uh, you know, he's an atheist. Oh, come here, you know, and uh, who's your high school science teacher? You know, and he's waiting for me to say my dad, and I'm like. Well, I had a lot of them. I mean, I, you know, who, who do you want? You know, yeah. which, which one do you want? <laughs> which grade? I, you know, <laughs> which grade? Yeah. And uh, and he goes, <laughs> he goes. Your dad wasn't your high school science teacher? I said, no. Oh, you, were you homeschooled? I was like, no, I wasn't homeschooled. Oh, you know, and they just, they, they, huh, you know, something on the internet is wrong. Why, why, my world is crazy now. I don't know what to think. You mean a Google search gave yeah. bad results? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no doubt. That's funny. Well, well, let me just ask the million dollar question All right. because this is, you know, speaking of internet rumors and, uh, and misinformation, um, you know, you can find people obviously that say the guy was a tax cheat, he broke all these laws, send him to jail, lock him up for the rest yeah. of his life. He was against the government. Yeah. Christians shouldn't be against the government. And then you go to the other side of the spectrum and you have people that absolutely say 100% because of the stands he was taking um, and because of the nature of his just kind of, listen, I'm not breaking the law and there's nothing you can do about it, uh, stance that he was made a target by the government. So just more of an opinion question more than anything. I mean, do, do, where do you stand on that? Was he a target or did he make some bad decisions somewhere in the middle? Where, what really yeah. went down? Uh, I, okay, a couple things on that. Do I think my dad made all the wise, uh, wise choices, the wisest choices? No. Yeah. I mean... Who of us always make the wise, wisest choices? So, uh, no. Uh, was he targeted specifically for uh, his stance on taxes? Uh, you know, some people say, oh, it's because he's a creationist. Well, there's a, I'm a creationist. You know? Right. <laughs> um, the, uh, was it, was, I, I think, obviously, yeah, there, there was a target on him for that. He was a, he was a voice out there. He was, he was publicly saying, uh, you know, hey, I think taxes are voluntary. Uh, and so was he targeted? Ultimately, yeah, yeah, he was targeted. Uh, is, um, I mean, just like they're going to target anybody for, right. for something like that. So uh, ultimately, was he, was he targeted? Yeah, uh, I have no problem with that. Was it because he was serving God? I don't think it's because he, I don't think that was the intention of the targeting. Uh, so I don't think you can say this is a, um, uh, what's the word? He's not. He he wasn't martyred for the sake of Christ, so to speak. This yeah. isn't over the gospel. Uh, was the gospel affected? Of course, but this wasn't over the sake of preaching the gospel. We are still free to preach the gospel in this country, and I'm right. and I'm thankful for that. Uh, may not have that much longer. So yeah. you, by the way, use it. Some Keep of you using are sitting it. Sitting yes. on your butt, not doing anything. Get busy. Serve God. Tell yeah. somebody about God. 
Don't pause yet, but in a second, go get out of your room, go tell somebody. And use it no matter wherever you are. That's right, man. Even if you're sitting in a prison cell, lead 400 men to Christ. That's exactly right, right, man. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you know what's interesting, kind of along those lines, you and I were talking again off camera, you know, that our struggle we sometimes forget is not necessarily against, Mm -hmm. you know, against flesh and blood, right? That's exactly right. It's not against the things of this world. So even though we can sit here and say, yeah, he was targeted probably, but it wasn't necessarily for his preaching of the gospel, but yet the powers to be, the powers of the air, not from of this big, world, yeah. from the big perspective, did they use it to silence, or was it attempted, you know, by a uh, use by Satan to silence him? Absolutely. Yeah. But let's look at what's come on the other side of that. You know, I mean, there's obviously negative things that have come of it, but like you said in the beginning, I mean, you know, by his accounts, he's led 400 men to Christ yeah. in prison. So yeah. his tapes are continuing to go out around the world. They are translated into. Uh, 41 languages now, uh, and it's, uh, it's amazing how many people are being reached with the truth. Yeah. God created the world. You're going to be accountable to that God one day. You better get ready for that day of accountability. Right. That, a day of reckoning really is coming and, uh, coming, and that really is, that's the overarching thing is, okay, big picture here, we're all targets. Yes. You're a target. I'm a target. Your dad's a target. You guys feel it. We feel it. We are targets, and it's and it's on a much 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 bigger scale. So, yeah, certainly we, you know, when it comes to targeting, we are all targeted, no doubt about it. I, um, you know, my dad does things that frustrate me to death, uh, to no end, and uh, I, uh, you know, I don't agree with the way he did everything he did, and there's all kinds of stuff uh, about that. But, you know, I I love my dad. I want to honor my dad. Um, I I. I'm willing to argue with my dad. Uh, I have <laughs> cried with my dad. I, you know, and uh, you know, when when I first started a 501c3 organization, my dad was like, "Uh, uh-uh, you better not do that." And you know, I'm, hey, you know, and and now my dad, in in conversations recently, he's going, "I can see why you did it," and okay, um, I might have to do something like that in the future, right? You know, so he's he's seeing. Look, if I want to operate in this in this world, I gotta. I got to bend a little bit there. Mm-hmm. So he's, um, pe- pe- people are going to take that and, and they're going to be frustrated with me and him. Um, I don't know what he'd say if you asked him what he thinks right. about that right now. But uh, I can tell you what, uh, I don't think that was a private conversation, does him say? Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm, yeah I'm going to have to change the way I do things. Yeah. So I, I don't know what's going to happen when he gets out. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I know he's got a lot of fire. Uh, I know. Um, uh, He's, I know he's probably going to tackle things that I don't want to tackle. So you know we do have we have two different ministries. Well, I have a ministry, and I'm sure when he gets out, he'll have, uh, you know, he'll he'll have a ministry uh, get started when he gets out. Um, I think he's going to want to take on the world again, man. He's just that's the that's his personality is yeah. bring it on. Well, and, and maybe that's the battle he was put here to fight. Yeah, maybe. And it may not God seem conventional wants, to you or I, yeah. but. If that's what God wants, go for it, man. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. A- absolutely. And if that's his conviction, then I wish him all the best in, <laughs> you know, in, in fighting those fights. So, yep. you Love know, you, Dad. <laughs> have fun over there. <laughs> no. Uh, well, uh, let me ask you this. What, um, you know, obviously going through that and having to live that and see your father fight those battles and then ultimately be in prison and then, you know, taken out of your life on a daily basis for almost 10 years now. How has that affected, uh, you know, decisions you've made? You talked about that a little bit from a business standpoint and just your ministry and, and, yeah. the, and the, the battles that you've chosen to fight. You know, whenever, uh, whenever all this first happened, I said to try to debate or counter the, the information that's happened and the, the, the information that's out there would be kind of like me trying to blow against a hurricane. Mm-hmm. It would be absolutely pointless. So I decided, let... Uh, First of all, I prayed. Man, and I, I have spent so much time in prayer over, over God. Give me wisdom what to do. I said, God, let me not just go out there and say, hey, oh, God, I'm not my dad. I'm not my dad. That wasn't me. <laughs> let me just show that by, by, being, uh, be, by being real, by, being an exa- by, by just letting the ministry work that I do be an example of what I'm about. I, I, I want to be about the gospel. I want to be about speaking truth. I want to be about equipping believers to defend their faith because most Christians can't defend their faith these days. Yeah, uh, that's what I want to be about, and and I think over the last seven and a half you know years, that's I think people see that. Look, this is different. Uh, it's grown me tremendously. I enjoyed being the kid 
who didn't have the responsibilities, who wasn't responsible for payroll, who wasn't responsible for fundraising, who wasn't responsible for traveling and speaking that much. I had it made, man. So I, man, it, it grew me. I had to, I had to grow up real quick. Um, uh, there's uh, God. God brought has brought incredible guidance in my 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 both my board of directors and in my leadership group of of. My, my, my advisory board of what decisions to make. And I'd say if you look at our ministry, we are, we are friends with all the other creation ministries. We have made inroads uh, that I never dreamed would happen. And it's still, it's humbling to think that um, this past summer, I got to be a speaker at the Answers in Genesis mega conference. That still boggles my mind that in a short couple of year period, we could, that God would say, Eric, I want to bring you out of that, out of the kind of the, ugh, the mire of that whole situation and just kind of say, look, this is, this is where you're going. And I kind of always figured, well, oh, that's, people are just going to keep shoving me down in that mire. And, and people still try to do that, obviously, but um, I am thrilled with the partnerships, the relational partnerships, the ministry partnerships that God has brought to creation today to, to say, let's go have an impact. Let's carry that on. I think, I think this has multiplied it. There, we've, we, we've gotten letters from over 80 people that have said, since Kent went to prison, I decided somebody needed to fill those shoes. Many people needed to fill those shoes. And I started, I started speaking on creation because of that. So I started going wow. out and doing talks. And, and Again, I want to be, we want to be an equipping ministry. How can we help other creationists do what they do? Yeah. Other people speak. Start talking to a Sunday school class. Start teaching some kids. Start having some people over to the house and doing a small group curriculum or a Bible study on creation. Get busy. Do something. This is the crux. This is the very, very foundation of which way does your worldview go. It all starts right here with this subject of creation versus evolution. Yeah. So... Um, it's grown me. It's uh, our ministry. I'm, I'm thrilled. We produce the Creation Today show. It's on uh, 12 different networks worldwide. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about what God has done with the ministry. And, you know, there's huge opportunities in the future with the Genesis movie, uh, with, uh, you know, partnerships and strategic partnerships. And uh, I don't know what all God has in the future, but I'm glad he has the future. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to continue to day by day walk and, and do what he has. So it's, it's been an exciting journey. You know, it's amazing. I'm sitting here thinking as you're talking and sharing this that, you know, we don't know day by day what the next day holds. Yeah. And, and we don't always understand our, our circumstances and our surroundings and situations. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I'm sitting here thinking again, I'm going back to what you said about, you know, the, the 400 plus men that he's led to Christ in prison. And then, you know, talking about how you liked being the kid that wasn't necessarily involved, but then you had to be. So, yeah. you know, it was, is it, can we sit here and say it's a good thing that your dad went to prison? I don't think that we would ever say that, you know, but on the other hand, we don't understand mm. in the past, we couldn't have understood, you know, if, if this happens to Kent and then later on down the road, these things fall into place and happen, mm -hmm. you know, you may not be where you are today. You may not oh, be involved in the ministry. No, uh, no your, your life may have taken a totally different turn. So, you know, we don't understand yeah. how God can use those things and work. You know, and I think too, you know, there, there's, there's some passages uh, specifically relating to the end times about, you know, for those that'll be, you know, hauled off the prison or die by the sword, they'll go to prison or they'll die by the sword. So you know, we're not in control yeah. and we don't understand. And God can take a situation that seems hopeless and seamless. Like you said, you thought you were always going to be pushed down and then now look where yeah. you've come to. So, you know, maybe that can be an encouragement to somebody that's listening to this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let God use you. If you, if you literally beg God, I, I spend my life begging God, God, I want to love you. I want to love my family. I want to love others. And I, I just say, God, guide me all the time. I, you, you know, talk about a prayer that I pray probably 20 times a day. God, give me wisdom. Yeah. God, help me. God, help me. And I just continually want to seek his face and, uh, and do his will. Um, no, it's not the path I would have chosen. Um, but I can tell you, right after he went in, I mean, little, right after, there was a peace I know he's gone, th this is the hardest thing he's ever gone through. Yeah. I mean, emotionally and emotionally, I, I do sense that, boy, he's, he's kind of, 
there's times where he's all over the board. Um, I, I don't know what he's going to, you know, which direction is he going this week as far as w when we communicate. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to him getting out and kind of figuring out what he wants to do and getting some stability because it's kind of frustrating right now. But right away I knew, you know, God has a plan here. Right. That there is my testimony. I put it on DVD called God's Glory is all about finally understanding the sovereignty of God, the glory of God. It's all for his glory. And I could see right away, hey, God's getting glory out of this. I can see ways he's getting glory out of this. Yeah. So does God use pain and suffering to accomplish his will? Uh, yeah, he can use pain and suffering to accomplish his will. Yeah. Can he use triumphs? Can he use victories to accomplish his will? Absolutely. God uses everything to accomplish his will, <laughs> yeah. to his end. For his purposes. You know, and it's amazing, too. I, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, we're talking about a man that hasn't had a public voice, so to speak, in, in, in eight and a half, eight, yeah. eight years now. Eight years, yeah. But we can sit here and talk about how his tapes mm. and his recording, uh, his works are still going all over the world. Yeah. Maybe even to a larger extent because of Could the publicity. Be. and th you, you know, I mean, you again, don't know. we don't want to glorify any wrong decisions or his position now, but... Just pointing out the fact that we don't know how God's going to use us yeah. or use a situation that may look terrible and bleak to us. Yeah. But again, here's a man who has no public voice, but yet God I can take you uh, on the Internet and I can show you his work yeah. that people are viewing you know, by, by the, the hundreds time. of thousands and millions every day. So. And that's the thing, as my dad says all the time, man, I'm sure glad we made that decision with those tapes. Because those yeah. tapes, there wow, are can you imagine if they weren't there? all over the place. Yeah. And and not copywriting them and saying, look, get them out there. Make it, share the message. That's what's most important. And, uh, and that's why even the, 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 I know people want to know what's going on with Kent Hovind. And we got our, there's the Kent Hovind followers that, <laughs> man, you know, they're diehard. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. don't follow a man, follow God. I'll right. tell you that right now. Don't follow a man, follow God. And I got the best dad in the whole world taught me so much stuff. So patient. Never yelled at me once. Slapped me one time. And it was because I back talked my mom and I, my hand went across my face and I went, he said, don't you ever talk to my wife that way. Loved his family, patient, a teacher, great childhood, loved my dad. I, I, amazing, amazing man uh, as far as all the things that he's taught me. Uh, but don't, don't follow a man. I don't follow a man. I don't follow my dad. Uh, I follow God. And same advice to you, don't follow, don't follow Kent Hovind. Don't be a Kent Hovindite. Be a, be a disciple of Christ. That's what God has called us to. I know we get you know, caught up in the what's going on, but the big picture is win souls. Yeah. If you're not out there winning souls, you've missed the boat. He that winneth souls is wise, is what Proverbs says. And I have a feeling that your dad would probably give those same words of advice right Absolutely. now. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's what he's doing, obviously. That's what he's so doing. Where, where he's at, so yeah. no doubt. Well, what, um, what's your communication with him like now? I mean, weekly, daily, monthly? I mean, obviously you can't just, <laughs> you know, go to the house and see him. So, yeah. I mean, how does that work for you? They've moved him uh, several times. It's his, I think, 13th move since wow. he's been in prison. So. Uh, 12th, 11th, 12th, 13th, something like that. Uh, he's now in New Hampshire, Berlin, New Hampshire. It was negative uh, 20 degrees up there, um, he told me. We have, he, there's a prison email system. Uh, he's in the lowest security there is. It's called a camp where okay. you, know, you can go out, you can walk around, there's a track, there's no fence. I mean, it's almost funny to me. I mean, you think about it, it's, it's like time out. That, he's in time out. You know, uh, you owe us a bunch of money, so we're going to put you in time. Literally, you go yeah. there. It's costing taxpayers $70,000 a year to keep my dad in time out. That's what it's costing taxpayers, to keep my dad in time out. And interestingly, in a place where he can't earn any money to pay the money he supposedly owes. Exactly. There's no, one, but there's no <laughs> gates. Another subject. <laughs> there's no fences around it. He could walk away if he wanted. Yeah. There, you know, obviously he's not going to do that. But, you know, there, there's no, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of rules, regular, you know, for, for all the things they do in prison. But he, he's in the lowest security one there is. Um, and he's, he's, uh, he's been reading, on average, I think, two books a week. Wow. <sighs> I mean... Now, I don't agree with everything he's reading, and that's part of our little, <laughs> come on, what are you talking about? You know, what, you think that? No way. So there's a little bit of that going on, but, uh, uh, you know, he's, 
he, he's just he's investing his time in learning and writing, and he's got a new position on the End Times that he can't wait to get out and tell everybody about. And uh, wow. I'm like, Dad, uh, nope, I'm not going to promote that for you. You, <laughs> you you do that on your own. I got I got no interest. Uh, I don't know. I'm, hindsight's 2020. Creation, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Revelation, I'll wait till it happens. I'll let your dad and and other and my dad can get together on that whenever he gets out. And I'm sure they will. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Believe me, I'm sure they will. Uh, he's uh, anyway. I, he's 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 in a camp. So we they have an email system, and so we get to email correspond via email, and then he gets a uh, 300 minutes per month of phone time. So if he's not uh, on the phone trying to, you know, talk to somebody about you know uh, the uh, whatever appeal he's got going on now, he's always man just. Well, that didn't work. Let me try this and that didn't yeah. work. You know, so he's always putting things in, and uh, so he gets to call and talk to us and uh, and email. Of course, we can write letters. Going to visit him is hard all the way up there in, in New Hampshire, uh, but uh, so I got to see him one time since he's been there in the last uh, sixteen months. Wow, and that was last August. Yeah, so he hasn't seen his grandkids in about uh, what is it, two and three years, maybe four years. Wow. Um, so I can imagine that's, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, a strain for both, for both sides there yeah, on that. Yeah, no doubt. That's tough. Well, um, you just, yeah, let me, let me, I'll just yeah, throw in there, man. I, the prison system does not help families. Yeah. It, it, my dad says all the time, and I, and I, and I can see why he says this. That's why, this is why God never instituted prison as a punishment. It's either you pay back money, you're beaten, mm-hmm. or you're killed. Yeah. Those are the three options in scripture. Prisons ruin Families, they cost the taxpayers, they cost society, and they ruin families. Yeah. In whose world is this a good idea? Yeah. This doesn't make sense. So uh, he's, you know, and I, I'm not a prison. I mean, I, I don't know what to do about prison reform. I'm not smart enough to do that. But uh, he's, he's. I can certainly understand why they don't uh, now, from this perspective, um, why they're not in biblical. Right. You know, from that perspective. So uh, it's, it's certainly not good on families, uh, not good on relationships. Doesn't help. Doesn't help. That, that's, so. that's an interesting perspective. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Um, well, what uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, does he have a current appeal underway or, um, yeah, he's, yeah. <laughs> or several appeals he underway? He has jumped from legal guru to legal guru to legal guru uh, trying, to, trying to get this thing figured out. And, and uh, the bottom line is, I mean, it's kind of like, well, I don't, the government can't let him win. Right. So it's almost like it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter if he is right. They're not going to let him win. Yeah. So um, I don't know. My opinion is dad quit. You know, quit trying to fight that. His opinion is, oh, when I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, I know people will disagree with what I just said about quitting the fight. Uh, no, that's why we love Kent Hovind. I know, I know, that's that's who he is. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to go around the mountain and, and sneak up behind or something like that. I don't know. I just focus on a different mission. But that's who he is. That's, yeah. you know, did God call him to this? I shouldn't have even asked that question because... I want to say, nope, he called him to creation. Didn't call him, but hey, uh, what does God have? Here it is, I believe in the sovereignty of God, so. Right, uh, only he and God can answer that he question. He and God can ultimate. answer that question, yeah. yeah. Is he in disobedience or is he, I don't know. I've, I've said, Dad, I leave that between you and God. Yeah. I, got, I got to do what I've, God's called me to do. I, I'm not responsible for anybody other than me and my family. And uh, and the way I spend my time and energy and efforts here on earth. So. Well, and you and I can talk about it, obviously. But I, I mean, in the, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's not our decision to make. You know, it's not our call. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's if true. he's not, then he'll be held accountable for it. And if he is, then yeah. you know, <laughs> he'll be rewarded for then it. Pray for him. <laughs> that's right. That he's got a tough call. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, um, just in kind of wrapping up and closing. Um, is there anything, uh, you know, any, any ways that people can, uh, can possibly help out? I, I mean, is there, uh, you know, I hate to even go here because I don't know what the stand is, but any type of legal defense fund? Um, it, you know, I mean, obviously prayers and thoughts. Uh, yeah. What, what can folks that just are interested in Ken Hovind and want to see the best for him and his life and maybe future ministry, what can they do? Uh, number one, <laughs> pray. If you want, pray. Number two. Go in souls. This this is nothing in light of eternity. Yeah. Seven years of a guy in prison is nothing compared to eternity. There, there, he, he's written about it. There are people that that serve way worse than what he's getting. That are that are treated with way more injustice. Go in souls. 
That's what matters. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that's going to make a difference in this world and in the world to come. So pray. If you want to help my dad, pray. Number two, get off your rump. Go tell somebody. Take a tract. Take a gospel tract. Go get involved in evangel. I tweeted this this morning. A lot of people like the idea of evangelism. Very few people do it. Go do something. Get busy. Uh, you can. There's all kinds of places that have stuff out there about my dad. And um, uh, I. I don't have. A, I, I stopped a legal defense fund for him. I said, Dad, I'm. I'm. I, I'm gonna be done with that. I'm gonna kind of wash my hands of that. So, I. I don't collect a legal defense fund for him. Um, I. I said, Dad, I'm gonna. I'm gonna invest my time and energy into spreading the gospel. You know, uh, we did that for several years as far as the legal defense fund. Fought, fought, fought. Went. Supreme Court didn't take the case. I said, okay, Dad, I, I got to be done with that. I don't. I can't spend any time on that. I gotta. I gotta focus on the other things that we're doing. So, I don't collect a legal defense fund for him. Um, there may be people out there doing that. I don't. Um, I'm. I'm about the gospel. So, uh, I'm looking forward to him getting out, giving him a big old hug, and telling him I love him, and uh, and keeping on ministering. Sounds great. Eric, yeah. we appreciate uh, your candidness and your openness on this subject. Uh, I'm sure it's not easy or fun yeah. to talk about, but like I say, there's a lot of people that I honestly want to know yeah. and uh, very much appreciate uh, you being willing to sit down with us and talk about it. And uh, best regards to your family and uh, obviously your father. And he will be in our prayers for sure. Well, Brandon, thank you very much. Yes, man. sir. Really appreciate it. Thank Take you. Take care. And then, of course, there's eternity, uh, talking a little bit about heaven and about hell. Uh, these are eternal destinations, eternal existence, heaven or hell. Everyone lives forever. It's just a matter of where. And um, I am uh, blessed to have a, a, a writer, Joel Joseph, of the Prophetic Scroll, is going to be doing these. Uh, I emailed him, and he said he would be happy to do that for me. Not surprising, um, yet it's tragic especially since Jesus Christ spoke more about hell than he did heaven. And the creator himself entered our creation, became a man to deliver us from that terrifying jeopardy that we all face. Now, of those that believe they're heaven bound, it's interesting too that uh, they feel they're going heaven bound because 43% felt they can they go into heaven because they confessed their sins and accepted Christ as their savior. Fair enough. About 15% feel they've tried to obey the 10 commandments. Whoops. And 15% feel they're going to heaven because they're basically a good person. That's a widespread assumption. 6% believe they're going to heaven because God loves all people and will not let them perish. So it's interesting, about 43% have a biblical view, and the others, of course, have, have some confusion on this whole topic. What's interesting about the research, this is all Barna uh, Research Group in Ventura, California, pulled this together. A lot of the findings are quite self-contradictory. Among born-again Christians, 10% believe that people are reincarnated after death. Isn't that confusing? 29% claim it's possible to communicate with the dead, even though necromancy, of course, is uh, strongly forbidden in the, in the Bible. 50% contend that a person can earn their salvation based on good works. There again, they haven't done their homework. And many believe that there are multiple options for gaining entry into heaven. So these contradictions um, prevail throughout the survey. Uh, many have redefined grace to mean that God is so eager to save people from hell that he will change his nature and universal principles for their own individual benefit. That's basically uh, what they uh, are assuming. And, uh, but let's talk a little bit about avoiding truth. You know, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. When, uh, Edmund Spencer is famous for that particular quote. You'll find the equivalent in the Bible in Proverbs 18.13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and shame unto him. So what I'm going to ask you to do is try to set aside the presumptions and, and uh, uh, presuppositions that we have on these topics, because we all have them. Let's try to set those aside and try to explore this difficult subject with an open mind. Is We need to understand that time is a physical property. It's not uniform. It varies with mass, acceleration, or gravity, among other things. Now, we and I live in 
in uh, more than four dimensions, actually. Actually, we know now that we probably live in about ten. I'll come back to that. See, the reason we have some misconceptions, when we were in school, the teacher would go to the blackboard and draw a line from left to right. And uh, the left end would be the beginning of something, the birth of a famous person or the founding of an empire. The right end of that line would be the end of the death of that person or the, the falling of that empire. And uh, all of us have made timelines in school. So when we encounter the concept of eternity, we tend to presume it's sort of like a line. It starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. We think of eternity as simply having lots of time, an unlimited amount of time. And that makes colorful poetry. It's one of our verses in our hymns, An Amazing Grace, uh, tends to presume that in effect. But let's ask ourselves a few questions. Let's talk about God. Is God subject to the restrictions of mass, acceleration, or gravity? Hardly. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. He is one who is outside the restrictions of time altogether. And that's exactly what Isaiah tells us, that uh, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, if he has the technology to create us in the first place, he has the technology to get a message to us. The question is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know the message we receive is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or some kind of a fraud? One way he authenticates it is to rely on an attribute that's unique to him, that he's outside the dimensionality of time. And so that's exactly what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 46, verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. God authenticates his message, among other things, by writing history before it happens, demonstrating that the origin is from outside time. So let's talk a little bit what I'll call the geometry of eternity. We've talked about, I've used a line horizontally in two dimensions here, but let, imagine this line that I'm showing on the screen is coming out at you in a third dimension. And behind, in, in the back part of the line is the past. Where we are, we'll call it the present. And what's ahead of us is the future. For us, life and time is a sequence of events from the past through the present to the future. But for someone who's outside the dimensionality of that timeline, say in what we call eternity, from that vantage point, they can see the past, the present, the future simultaneously. We can't imagine that because we are limited in our thinking to what this, the dimensionality that we're constrained to. But someone that is outside the dimensionality, that's no problem. Let me give you a, 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 something you might be able to visualize. Imagine you're sitting on a curb watching a parade. Around the corner comes the marching units, the bands, the troops, whatever. And as they, as they come by, for you, the parade is a sequence of events. They come around this corner, they go down the street, they go out and out that way. For someone who's outside the plane of that existence, say in a helicopter above the parade, they can see the staging area where the units are forming up. They can watch the parade as it you know, snakes through the city that it's going in, and they can also see where it's disbanded, to going back to storage or whatever. So they can see simultaneously the beginning, what's happening, and the end from, from their vantage point. It's a, perhaps a clumsy analogy, but it gets across the idea that another dimension adds all kinds of capabilities. We call the mystery of our destiny. What's our predicament today? And uh, there is a dark side to all of this, of course. We realize that we are vulnerable to a deceiver. We have an adversary. And this adversary isn't the, the typical devil or Satan that get pictured in the literature or in Halloween or whatever. He can masquerade as the angel of light. And his basic technique is deception. So we're entering an area that, in which deception is our primary, uh, the primary tool of our adversary. So we run into all kinds of information that in modern terms is called channeling and, all, and, and the spiritism and all this sort of thing is in the periphery of our discussion here. But in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, 1 Corinthians shreds that as being prohibited. Not just something you shouldn't do, it was punishable by death in ancient Israel. And reincarnation is another one of these. We joked about it earlier. But clearly the scripture in Hebrews 9.27 is appointed unto man but once to die and then the judgment. There's no recycling going on here. That's a, a uh, myth out of the pit of hell. 
And so, but as we go into any other sources in the scripture, let's be on our guard because Satan's primary weapon is deception. And his agenda is to have you destroyed. That's his goal. And he has incredible resources to try to bring that about. And so he would like you to believe that there is no such thing as a judgment, that there is no real accountability to our Creator. Anything that tends to suggest that has as its origin Satan's lie, all the way to Genesis chapter 3, his first lie, which was to create doubt. Yea, hath God said that, and then direct denial. Ye shall not surely die, he tells Adam, which of course was a lie. And uh, you know, it's interesting, the other idea that Satan would like you to believe is that there are many paths to God. And Jesus talked about that. He says, broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, Jesus said. Narrow is the gate that leads to, to, to uh, salvation. And so we need, if you're going through a gate that's very popular and lots of people are joining you, be careful. You probably have the wrong gate. So let's move on here. But the basics are the fall of man is the basis of death. Death was not originally intended. God is... Um, um, Death is a result of the fall of man. Death is an ins uh, inescapable e fact. We mentioned that from Hebrews 9.27. is appointed on demand but once to die and after this the judgment. Science will never conquer death. That's mentioned in Job 14 and Ecclesiastes 3, but I think it's pretty self-evident if that's the cause of it. And uh, death is man's punishment for disobedience. Romans 5 hammers on that. Romans 6, James 1, and so on. Now the point you want to get across here is death is separation of the body and the soul. Separation is not annihilation. There's some that would like to cling to the appealing idea that, uh, that uh, losing is to, be, is to cease to exist. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Now in Revelation 20, you know, as the big climax finishes in Revelation, death and hell, are, that's Hades, are cast into Gehenna. That's called the second death there. So even Hades is temporary. Sheol and Hades are temporary. They're destined to be cast into Gehenna in the outer darkness. Now obviously we find fire and brimstone all through the scripture so frequently that you can't dismiss it, the fire that never gets quenched. And I don't want to imply that there isn't a real fire, but I'm going to also suggest to you that they are metaphors that what they really involve may be far more serious than any fire you and I have any conception of. The beast and the false prophet are thrown in those fires at the beginning of the thousand years. Satan's bound for a thousand years and then released for a while. And he joins them after a thousand years and when he joins them they're still there burning. So it's a fire that never consumes. So it's a very different kind of experience. So now some insights. I want to summarize what we learned from Luke 16. The man in Hades was fully conscious. He wasn't asleep. He had memory. He could speak. He experienced pain. He also experienced desires. And some of the most painful part of this may be the unfulfilled desires. His eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed. No reprieve. Not even discussed. He also apparently knew what he was experiencing was fair and just. He also knew what his brothers needed to do to avoid his own fate, namely repent. Interesting, it was a lot interesting. And by the way, he wasn't in hell yet. He was in that bad side of Hades. Now there's another thing that occurs at the cross. It's generally regarded by most conservative Bible scholars that between the time that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose that Easter morning, that he emptied Abraham's bosom. He took those faithful that were accumulated in Abraham's bosom to himself. Where do we get that? Well, let's talk about it. In 1 Peter 3, Peter writes, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, when it says preached, we always think of preaching as trying to change somebody's mind. No, he's, the word there just means declare. Jesus went down there to declare his victory on the cross. 
is victory over death. Now, now we're plunging right into this difficult, difficult area of the doctrine of hell. And uh, pastors typically will reluctantly acknowledge it uh, because it's clearly the scripture says flee from the wrath to come and so forth. But as a result of it not being mentioned more, most people treat it strangely with indifference. It's a touchy subject. It's a tough, unpleasant subject. So we don't talk about it much. And because we're indifferent to it, there's widespread ignorance on this whole topic and all its ramifications. And because of the ignorance, we have doubt. Many people, many Christians, don't really believe in a hell. And uh, they're, they're thus in denial. They, they have several ways they try to get around this. And because of denial, it gets to be an irritable subject. And that brings you right back to the lack of acknowledgement and so forth. So this is a tragic cycle that we're in within the body of Christ, within the church. Let's talk a little bit about the justice of God. There will be a last judgment. Every person is going to be resurrected and judged individually. Every hour of every life, every hidden thought, every motive, words spoken in secret will be made public. Excuse me, will be made public. There'll be no misinterpretations. All court cases will be retried, I suppose. All blame will be accurately proportioned. There'll be no unsolved crimes. There'll be no hidden bribes. The accounting of every detail of each of our lives. Every thought, every motive, and so forth, but also what everyone did with what they knew. To whom much was given, much is required. Did you know that all religions lead to God? Oh, they do indeed. The problem is, <laughs> it won't be Buddha, Confucian, or Muhammad, or whoever. It'll be Jesus Christ as judge. All religions are going to lead to the judgment, and the guy sitting on the judgment seat will not be any of these leaders. It'll be the person of Jesus Christ himself. Now the Father, we know from John 5, 27, the Father has given all authority for the judgment to Jesus Christ. So he is, he's got the whole ball game here. This final exam is very real. Jesus said, I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Boy, boy, that's, that's scary. Willingly ignorant is the key phrase here. People who deny God are doing it as a decision. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a choice thing. Let's so talk more about this punishment. That we know that the punishment is conscious. It includes passions, desires, memories, and regrets. It's eternal. Dante, in his literature, summarized it so well in one way. He says, abandon, he had, over the, he had it pictured that over the doorway, it says, abandon all hope who enter here. We have no ability to imagine what it's like to be without hope. Now here, you and I can't imagine being totally without hope of any kind. One of the part of the punishment is to be exposed for your own sin for eternity. Disconnected from all painkillers and so forth. There's been a number of summaries trying to summarize all that we think we know about the impenitent. Certainly, they'll be suffered, become the loss of all earthly good, from the utter expulsion from the presence and favor of God. We can't imagine what that's like, because we probably don't realize that every cell division in our body involves God's intervention. We can't imagine being disconnected from the source of all life. From the utter withdrawal of the Holy Spirit, we can't imagine that. For the consequent unrestrained dominion of saint and, uh, sin and uh, uh, sinful passions. Our own sin, our own sinful passions may be the source of a, a large portion of our punishment. From the operations of our conscience, from despair, from evil associates, from external circumstances, and from their per perpetuity, they never cease. This is just one summary by Charles Hodge, there's others. There's, two, there's distributive justice, we call that mercy, God's grace. There's the retributive justice, and that's what we're talking about here. Why? For at least three reasons. To vindicate the king's righteousness. And the king of the universe who is, has an intrinsic nature of righteousness. So it's, it calls for uh, these to be either uh, paid for or performed. Also to defend the moral order of his kingdom. This is essential when you think that through. 
It also is essential in order to highlight the preciousness of the servant who died to make us just. Can't compromise any one of those three. It's not in God's nature. See, God loves everybody. He loves his son more. And he's going to vindicate the price that his son paid on our behalf. This retributive justice is the response of positive holiness, reasserting the moral order of the world against all that is evil. Can evil be forgiven? No. Satan and his angels are consigned there. They clearly are there forever. There's no, there's no compromise here. There are degrees of punishment. Not all are equal. To whom much is given, much will be required. We've talked about that. Clearly there's degrees of punishment. And I mentioned even earlier that even withholding truth can be an act of mercy. Because if there's a truth, and God knows you're not going to believe it anyway, giving you that truth increases the punishment you're destined to. So that's a, a reality. 2 Corinthians 8, 12 is an interesting verse. It's further, if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to what a man hath, not according to what he hath not. But there are difficulties for all of us. We all, if we're honest with ourselves, have difficulties with this concept of eternal punishment. Does the punishment fit the crime is our question. Well, that really begs a different question. Do we really understand God's attitude towards sin? I don't think so. I don't think so. Remember, adultery was a capital crime in Israel. We wouldn't even think of doing that in our culture. We can't handle that. <laughs> if we did, we'd probably cut the population less than half. Horoscopes were a capital crime. I won't ask for a show of hands how many people take a glance at the paper to see what their horoscope is. They just as a piece of entertainment or something. Every major paper has a horoscope column. In ancient Israel, to cast a horoscope made you punishable to death. God doesn't mess around. He took these things seriously. You see, our sensitivity to sin is calloused by our culture and our attitudes. See, what we fail, fail to understand is two things we fail to understand. We don't understand the magnitude of sin on the one hand, but here's the real corker. We can't appreciate the majesty of God on the other. Part of the, the, the seriousness of sin isn't just the intrinsic in the sin itself. It's who is it against? And when it's against an infinite being, you see, sin is a violation of the character of an infinite being. Then we begin to get the message here, this, this serious stuff going on. A God deserving of worship cannot issue an arbitrary amnesty for humanitarians or pantheists who persist in worshiping and serving themselves more than their personal creator himself. The condemnation of everyone who is lost will be wholly attributable to himself or herself for having disregarded God's revealed will. And that will is sufficiently revealed just in the creation itself. That's the shocker to me. As you read your Bible, oh boy, there's lots of visibility. But it really amazed me to, that the Bible takes the position that just the creation itself is enough revelation for you to respond to. Well, we talked about the paradigm of death, where we have the physical death, the separation of the soul and the body, and uh, spiritual death, the soul and the spirit, and then the soul is resurrected to, for its ultimate death. But that's not for the believer. See, the believer has the Holy Spirit indwelling. And so, indeed, he may experience physical death in terms of being separation from the body. But that's as far as it goes. Why? The second death was paid for on the cross. Jesus went there for us. So let's get to heaven a little bit. We've been in some pretty grim footage here. Let's take a little look here at some other things. The joys of heaven. It's a newly created environment that will be unsullied by any kind of moral evil. That itself speaks volumes. It'll include the ultimate model city. We, we see this new Jerusalem, and I'll show you a few renderings of that, but uh, let me tell you, they're no, they don't come close. <laughs> we'll enjoy a deathless existence in our resurrection bodies, and I'll talk a little bit about our resurrection bodies. We'll be knowing and loving God maximally. Boy, that's, the, that's probably the best part of it all. We'll have fellowship with other believers. Now, I know there's some believers you just soon skip, but uh, we'll all have lost our sin nature by then. 
We apparently will retain our gender and personal and ethnic characteristics. That's interesting, but it's, it, 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 there's scripture that seems to indicate that. We'll have renewed intellectual, emotional, and volitional abilities, and that's also very exciting. What he did. Well, my dad, uh, amazing guy. Uh, I love my dad, and I pray that everything I do uh, would honor my dad, as the Bible commands. Uh, he was, uh, got saved at 16 years old in high school. Immediately after, realized, I want to tell more people about this. After he led his first soul to Christ at the age of 16 years old, after he had been saved, well, God did, but after, after he let, literally, you know, dealt with them and they accepted Christ, he just, he knelt down. He said, God, can I do this the rest of my life? And that's literally what he's done. He has spent his life investing in other people and witnessing to other people. And I, I don't know how many of you are going to be in heaven, you know, because of my dad's life. And he's not keeping track or it's all for the glory of God. But he has literally spent his life since he was 16 years old doing that and trying to invest in kingdom work. Yeah. He said all the time, Eric, we don't need to build a mansion here. We need to win a war. Yeah. Let's, let's lay up treasures in heaven. So uh, that's certainly what he's done. In 1989, we moved. Uh, he, he was a, a high school principal, a science teacher, uh, a pastor. Uh, he uh, man, ran everything he did. It was just, he's just got something about him, man. It just makes people want to listen. They want to hear him. Um, in 1989, we moved from California here to Florida, and it began Creation Science Evangelism. Actually, my brother, Kent, came up with that name. He said, hey, it's Creation, it's Science, and it's, you're evangelizing. So <laughs> Creation Science Evangelism, which is now known all over the place. And he did a couple of unique things. He said, God, I'll do this, but number one, I don't want to copyright my videos. I want to get them out there for free so everybody can, can, can listen to them. And uh, it wasn't the digital age back then. This was uh, when you could make some money off of, you know, uh, the old cassette tapes and the VHS tapes. And, and he, uh, he said, I don't want to copyright them. Let people copy them and give them away. And that was, that was pretty huge. And then he said, God, I, d I don't want to charge for my meetings. I just want to go and, and um, I just want you to provide. And man, God really did. And so God used my dad in a variety of ways. And uh, my dad had uh, lots of visions and lots of things to do. Began, uh, eventually started Dinosaur Adventure Land, which was a, you know, a science center slash theme park type thing slash museum kind of all combined into one that uh, the kids love to come to and uh, really became well known for his debates taking on evolutionists uh, going out and, and he's, he got really good at debating. Yes. Um, <laughs> he got, uh, you know, traveling and speaking. He was traveling and speaking over, uh, you know, as, as far as between radio and all the different talks he did on a weekend. He, he would do over 900 talks a year. So he was incredibly busy with his schedule. And really, um, uh, you know, learned from the late Dr. Henry Morris from Institute for Creation Research, which kind of pioneered the whole creation movement, uh, and and others to, and just said, I want to popularize this. I want people to know we've got the truth. So brought it down to fourth grade level. Uh, people could understand that the science and and God had, had had used him and still uses his videotapes. We still get emails and testimonies and. Still get all that, so still using that uh, today. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. You know, you and I were having some conversation earlier, um, and I remember as a kid, um, when you guys first came here, my dad and your dad met. That's right. And kind of hit it off, had a lot of the same ideas, uh, and I remember your dad coming and speaking uh, at Hickory Hammock Church Hammock. in the oh, old yeah. sanctuary, you know, <laughs> sat a hundred people, you know. But I, no, I mean, I remember that. I mean, I, I was, I don't know, I mean, 89, 12 years old. Yeah, that's back when we were still looking at the girls yeah man. exactly like, so, but but no i mean i remission for life well i would want to argue that there's a logical path from any ideology that's fanatical and oppressive to the kind of behavior you say whether it's uh, religion or atheistic because atheism is a faith of course as well it's not of it's course it is <laughs> don't you believe it Folks, welcome again. Uh, it's another segment with uh, P.P. Simmons News and Ministry Network. It's uh, January the 9th. I'm here with Eric Hoven of Creation Today. And uh, Eric has been kind enough to sit down with us today and uh, discuss some things from the past, uh, specifically uh, involving his father and some of his ministry endeavors and then his current situation. And um, we know that this you know, can be kind of a touchy subject, obviously, but Eric, very much appreciate um, your willingness to do this and uh, just to kind of get some things out and answer some questions for some folks. Um, we get comments and questions 
concerning your dad uh, yeah. through the P.P. P. Simmons uh, ministry quite often uh, because of the uh, similarity in some of the topics that we get into, specifically yeah. with evolution and creation. So um, we just want to kind of let people know what's going on, maybe dispel some myths. Uh, there's <laughs> there's myths out there? What? <laughs> what? Yes, yes, there are. Uh, maybe dispel some myths, uh, let people know what's going on. Um, and just uh, just kind of maybe clear the picture up on you know on, on what happened and where things are today. So uh, appreciate the opportunity very much. Well, thanks, Brandon. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just first of all, for people that may have never heard of uh, of Kent Hovine and, and uh, his work and who he was, just tell us a little bit about him. You know, uh, the ministries that he started and okay. um, kind of you know. If I could prove to your satisfaction that God, the God of the Bible exists, would you worship him? No. If I believed that God exists, and I believed that it was the Bible God that existed, I would not worship it, because it is a criminal thing. Now, if a better God existed than the one in the Bible, I still wouldn't worship it, but at least it would be worthy of respect. That's what I wanted to find out. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Yes, sir. can easily see the limits of science because it cannot answer the elementary questions of a child. Who am I? What is the purpose of my existence? Where am I going? As you know, there's a, there's a problem with American education that some nutcases are trying to introduce creationism into American schools, which is obviously very bad for science. And my scientific colleagues are deeply worried by this and are trying to fight it. And I would like to suggest, Richard, that somewhere down in this you're making a category mistake. Now, the thesis here is that science supports atheism, not Christianity. I think atheism under undermines science very seriously. I would suggest that the sophistication of the mechanism, and science rejoices in finding such mechanisms, is evidence for the sheer wonder of the creative genius of God. My final vestige, last vestige of religious faith disappeared when I finally understood uh, the Darwinian explanation. I remember that, and I can remember some of the analogies and some of the things mm. that your dad said even that night, and it was so simple to understand. I mean, yeah. here I was probably sixth, seventh grade, somewhere around in there, and I remember that, and I also know that his teachings and some of the stands that he took uh, influenced my dad in his early ministry yeah. and in getting involved in the creation evolution debate and look where that's gone today. Oh, man, here I so, thought it was going to be over. Yeah. I thought, man, <laughs> all right, this can't evolution ain't going to last long at this rate and it's big. Yeah. It's one of the biggest debates going on right now. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah, no, no no doubt about it, no doubt. Well, um what um I know that he was involved. I mean, you can get on YouTube and I can find videos and projects that he was involved in, uh, you know, just oh, all man. over the place. Yeah. And not only evolution, but he was involved in uh, in some end times prophecy stuff. Um, he was one of oh, the, yeah. he was, uh, you know, one of the not one of the first, but to very publicly start questioning the pre tribulation movement and yeah. some of those theories on prophecy in the end times. So I mean, he had an amazing effect uh, in oh, the yeah. Christian world, you know, in his own right, and. Um, I believe he was one of the first guys to really push the creation, uh, the creation evolution debate to the level that it has now gotten to. To a popularizing level of yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt about it. He was uh, he was out there. I mean, there were several guys uh, that are that are that were doing that, but he certainly had uh, wow. Uh, he was just all over the place. Yeah. God, well, God I, I remember used some him. of his. Uh, he would publicly offer to uh, to debate anyone. I think it was like a, a ten thousand dollars or something like that at the oh, time. For he did. He said. Uh, he said, "Hey, I will get." It started off at ten thousand dollars. He said, "I will give ten thousand dollars to anybody that can give me 